Hello everyone, and today I wanted to talk about <clears throat> neutrality in the Artsakh conflict, in the uh, conflict for Nagorno-Karabakh. And, you know, I've noticed recently especially, and, you know, in the past several years really, a growing trend in not only the media, but in general public opinion, uh, in terms of people who know something about the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, that uh, there's a growing trend of neutrality, or faux neutrality, I should say, and people trying their very hardest to justify the aggression of Azerbaijan in the past, I guess now you could say seven to eight years, uh, if we count from the four-day war of 2016. Now, um, I just want to give a little background on this. I've I've even had friends, you know, well-educated friends in, you know, the Middle East and the region who have said, well, you know, uh, both sides did bad things. There was ethnic cleansing on both sides, and we can't side with one side or another uh, for that reason because there isn't um, a side on the side of justice. And... You know, this is something that is very, very harmful, very destructive to everyone involved in this conflict because there is a clear aggressor and there has been a clear aggressor from the beginning of the conflict. And I don't want to say the beginning of the conflict in the early 90s because this conflict really started long before that. Um, first thing I want to bring up before actually going into the nitty-gritty <clears throat> is the issue of the balance of power. Now, when you have two sides that have such an immense disparity in power, and you don't have a balance of power, um, and one side is clearly, clearly superior to the other in terms of pure strength, then pure neutrality is only going to benefit the strong. It will not benefit the side that is on the side of justice or truth, unless that is the side that is also strong, right? So when you do try to have this false neutrality between two powers that have such, such different <clears throat> strengths, you just... Um, uh, inflame the conflict and really just allow the strong side to walk all over the weak side. We see this in the Israel-Palestine conflict. We see this in conflicts between minority groups and um, regional powers all the time. Um, it's like trying to say that, you know, Poland should have negotiated with Nazi Germany. Right? Poland was also at fault. It's it's just harmful to try and create a sense of false neutrality when there's such a disparity in the balance of power. Now, the next point I want to bring up, I want to go into a little bit of nitty-gritty. Uh, Armenia was the aggressor in the first conflict. I've seen this in many uh, videos, many uh, top, top videos by neutral, allegedly neutral commentators, um, non-Armenian, non-Azeri commentators, um, and these are very popular videos. I've seen these people cover the conflict and say, you know, Armenia was the aggressor in the first conflict in the 90s. And to that, I say you have no understanding of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, or you do, and you're actually a wolf in sheep's clothing, a bad actor. And um, all I have to say about that is that in the first conflict, again, Azerbaijan was the aggressor. And let me give the background on that. In as long as Soviet Azerbaijan, I'm going to skip over uh, Nagorno Karabakh being given to Azerbaijan in the 1920s because uh, that would be far too long of a video, and I think others have covered it, but I might do a video about that as well. But as Nagorno Karabakh was controlled essentially by the Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan. In that period, that's when you start to see in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 
colonization program in the Nagorno-Karabakh Oblast. You see as Soviet Azerbaijan try to change the demographics of the region so that, you know, later on they wouldn't have an issue with a minority group trying to achieve independence and freedom from them. Now, um, this program is well documented. You can look up details about that. I might put a link in the description. But aside from that, there was also, you know, serious neglect of this oblast, of the region, and of the rights of the local population, of the rights to uh, good infrastructure, of the rights to um, the same treatment as the rest of the population in the country. They were clearly second-class citizens, and that's how they felt, and that's how it was. And, you know, eventually you get to the late 80s and uh, early 90s when about 70, I think the official figures are 75 to 80 percent of the population of the oblast was Armenian. And you have the situation in Soviet Azerbaijan in the late 80s where they were pogroms against the Armenian populations of Kirovabad, of uh, Sumgait, of Baku, and you have thousands of victims in these pogroms um, in terms of uh, deaths and also, of course, refugees. Hundreds of thousands had to flee their homes due to anti-Armenian violence in uh, Soviet Azerbaijan. And this eventually extended to something called Operation Ring, which was essentially with approval from Mo Moscow, a military operation against uh, Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh and the surrounding area. And this operation was essentially ethnic cleansing, the beginning of ethnic cleansing in Nagorno-Karabakh and the surrounding region, ethnic cleansing against the Armenian population, and genocide against the Armenian population with Soviet complicity. And, um, you know, the Armenian population that started to protect itself from this, this was self-defense because they knew that, they knew what fate awaited them. During the Armenian Genocide, you have the heroic self-defense battle at uh, Musadar, the 40 days of Musadar, where the local villages in that region, in sort of um, western Syria on the coast, in southern Cilicia, you have the, this group of villages who see what's going on in the rest of the Armenian populated regions of the Ottoman Empire, and they uh, decided to go to the mountain uh, of Musadar and uh, defend themselves against the Ottoman forces. And there is, there's no neutral, you can't be neutral in such a conflict. Like, uh, the aggressor was clear. Same thing in the early 90s. Azerbaijan, both Soviet and post-Soviet Azerbaijan, were clearly genocidal, clearly... Um, the aggressors in the conflict with the Armenian population, the civilian Armenian population, and eventually the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh decided that no, they would not allow themselves to be the victims of ethnic cleansing and genocide like all of the other Armenians in Soviet Azerbaijan. And again, hundreds of thousands were forced to flee the violence from Kirovabad and Sumgait and Baku and other regions. And uh, the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh defended themselves. And they started to defend themselves. And when they started to defend themselves, that's when uh, Armenia was able to send support to the local defense forces. And that's when Armenia got involved in the conflict. Armenia was not an aggressor in the first Nagorno-Karabakh war. That's just... It's a statement in bad faith. It's, it's a genocidal statement. It's a statement that supports the genocide of indigenous populations. And that's what people have to understand. This Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh 
is the indigenous population of the region. They have inhabited the region for centuries upon centuries. And they have a right to live in their homeland. And no power has the right to commit ethnic cleansing of an indigenous population like that. Now, uh, some people, in terms of this uh, Armenia was the aggressor narrative, bring up the seven surrounding regions of Nagorno-Karabakh. And to that I say, look at the map. Look at the map. Nagorno-Karabakh Oblast was drawn in such a way, it was drawn in such a way that it would not have a land connection with Armenia. So if Armenia, if the Republic of Armenia is moving in support to help the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh not get ethnically cleansed, how are the Armenian forces supposed to not secure a land connection with Armenia and take areas like uh, Kelbajar? Like, is there any explanation for that? How were they not supposed to take the land in the south to create a buffer so that the Lachin corridor, the Lachin connection to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh from Armenia is not compromised, is not put under siege, is not blockaded. How do you expect these people to defend themselves if those areas are controlled by a genocidal army? It makes, it, it makes no sense. There is no way that those areas could have remained outside of the war zone if Armenia was to move in and save the local population from genocide. There was just no way. And we see the result of giving those territories up in the past few years. We see the result of that. The result was genocide and ethnic cleansing. Now, the next point I want to bring up shortly is that, again, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is simply a continuation of the Armenian genocide that really began in the late 1800s. It's wrong to say the Armenian genocide was just between 1915 and 1918 in the eastern uh, regions of the Ottoman Empire. It's just not accurate to say that. And if you read the history of the conflicts in the 1890s of the massacres, you'll know that the Ottoman government was already genocidal from that point in time. And everybody knew it. Um, not every, I don't want to say everybody. Many people knew that. Many people knew that. The people who were right about what ended up happening in 1915 knew that. Like um, Antranik Ozanyan, to name one person who foresaw what would happen. And today, Azerbaijan, simply acting as a proxy of the Republic of Turkey, which supports Azerbaijan in its genocidal activities through and through, is just acting as a proxy for Turkish interests, which is wiping Armenia off the map, creating that land connection between Turkey and Azerbaijan, and creating, again, going towards their pan-Turkic uh, goals. And my concluding thoughts here are, you cannot be neutral in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between uh, the Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh, the indigenous population, and the government of Azerbaijan and Turkey, to a degree. You can't be neutral because being neutral means, or creating a false neutrality, means that basically you're okay with genocide. It's that simple. That's all I want to say today. Um, if you enjoyed this video, uh, maybe follow because I am looking to record some more. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much everything I have to say for today. Uh, thank you for listening. And please give me your thoughts in the comments.